Before viewing this episode, please click the link in the description box and become a Patreon for $1.99 a month to continue watching the first season of Blood Currency. Blood Currency is a weekly crime network detailing the lives of the underworld's most infamous. Thanks for watching. Haiti, the first free black republic. Haiti's independence during the time of slavery and mistreatment of Africans all over the world symbolized strength and honor. Haiti's independence came with a cost. Billions of dollars in debt to France after the Haitian Revolution in 1804. As Haiti went from being the richest European colony entering the 1800s into absolute poverty, natives had to find ways to survive. Over 150 years later, drugs began to flow through the Caribbean, cocaine being one of those. One man controlled the cocaine trade in Haiti by himself in the 80s through the 90s. This individual is said to have been the Pablo Escobar of Haiti. His name is Baudouin Jacques Caton. Jacques was born and raised in Haiti at a time period in Haiti when the Haitian government was ruled by Francois Papa Doc Duvalier. Papa Doc ruled Haiti with an iron fist, creating a militia which enforced his laws in Haiti. Thousands of Haitians lost their lives in the Duvalier era, and after his death in 1971, Papa Doc's son, Jean Claude Duvalier, known as Baby Doc, succeeded him as president at the age of 19. It was just a year ago this week that Francois Duvalier, president for life of the Caribbean Republic of Haiti, died and passed on his rule to his young son, Jean-Claude. During the 14 years that Papa Doc was in the palace in Port-au-Prince, tales of savagery there became a commonplace. His dread Tonton Macout, his secret police, imposed a rule as fearful as any in the long and bloody history of Haiti. But what has happened in the year since Papa Doc died? 60 Minutes went to Haiti to find out. We begin with a recital of some basic, if unlovely, facts of Haitian life. For 167 years, ever since its revolution dislodged the French in 1804, Haiti has been torn by terror, bloodshed, and despair. Its 34 presidents, only six have finished their term in office. The others were either overthrown or killed. Still, Haiti likes to call itself the Pearl of the Antilles. It had surely been that for the French, said to be the richest, the most prosperous colony in all the world. Coffee and sugar, mahogany and molasses were the treasures. But after the half-million blacks revolted against their white masters, they began to fight among themselves. The agricultural economy disintegrated. The big plantations were broken up. Today, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Most of her five million people live at bare subsistence level. The average annual income for a Haitian is $75. His life expectancy is 48 years. 80 of every 100 Haitians are illiterate. And like so many undeveloped countries, this one too is in the middle of a population explosion. As Haiti went to turmoil in the 70s and 80s, a new form of revenue entered the island, cocaine. Pablo Escobar, who by the 1980s became the biggest drug trafficker in history, was constantly searching for innovative ways to transport his cocaine to the United States. 
Pablo's $60 million a day business soon infiltrated Haiti after Baby Doc's exile in 1986. By 1987, Pablo sent his most trusted men to Haiti to secure a pipeline and build relationships with officials using tactics such as bribery so they could look the other way. A monitored airstrip in Port-au-Prince was built by the bribed officials and was used for the sole purpose of transporting pounds of cocaine. The prime overseer for this operation was Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Michael Francois. Under Joseph's supervision, the airstrip transported over 70,000 pounds of cocaine to the United States. Joseph earned an estimate of $4 million for his contribution. Jean Bertrand Aristide was sworn in as president of Haiti in 1991. and was subjected to several assassination attempts due to his stance on the Duvalier era and the consequences their reign in Haiti brought. An uprising occurred involving Lieutenant Francois and RSD went to Venezuela in 1991. President Jean-Bertrand Aristide attended the summit. He emphasized the strength of his nation in partnership with other countries. We will be moving with the international community with the most powerful country in the world, telling how it's possible to change that world, to make it better, building a new world order. Alone, Haiti could never do that. We are not alone. We are with you. We are with all of you. After RSD's departure, Lieutenant Francois appointed himself as the head of port au princes police department placing his most trusted lieutenants at Haiti's ports and the capital airport. Lieutenant Francois sees cocaine from competitors and other drug traffickers. Kilos of cocaine from the seizures will go to Haiti's top drug supplier, Jacques Quetin and his crew. Jacques Quetin had connections in Little Haiti and tasked smugglers were making connections with airport workers in order to allow drugs to pass without issue. Little Haiti is a small city in Miami with a high population of Haitians. Jacques employed his brothers, cousins, and brothers-in-law. The Quetin enterprise became the family business. Lieutenant Francois protected the smugglers in Haiti. They had free reign and could do what they wanted. Members of the Haitian military moved Jacques cocaine around and always made sure it was ready to ship out at the airport. In the summer of 1994, Jacques was arrested by the Haitian narcotic squad, then released back to the streets within 24 hours. To communicate with one another, Jacques' men would say phrases such as, the bird left the nest, the bird arrived, or the package just arrived. These phrases determined where the money was coming in and out of Haiti, as well as cocaine. Between 1992 and March of 1995, Jacques traveled from Haiti to the United States an estimated 40 times. Jacques frequented South Florida, where he hung out in Little Haiti, attending clubs such as Neptune's and Eight Ball. In the United States, Jacques had drug connections in Miami, New York, and Chicago. Jacques brought an estimated 30,000 kilos to the United States. The government noticed a pattern between the Haitian traffickers and the increased cocaine presence in Miami. So an investigation began. In January of 1992, three kilos of cocaine were seized by officials and the flight itinerary has Jacques' full name on the same flight. In September of 1993, customs agents found 63 pounds of cocaine at that same airport on an incoming flight from Haiti. The luggage which had the cocaine had the phone number to Jacques' sister's husband. Undercover DEA agents purchased kilos from Jacques' men and were able to secure wiretaps containing discussions of murdering snitches. In May of 1996, DEA agents in New York City found nine kilos of cocaine at JFK Airport. Jacques was present and he ran off in a car, then continued on foot. In his escape, he left a briefcase behind, which contained his ID. 
and a notebook filled with the names of traffickers from his organization. Jacques was able to make it to Miami and get on a plane headed to Port-au-Prince dressed as a woman. In March of 1997, a 22-count indictment on Jacques, Lieutenant Francois, and 11 members of the Quetan organization came down. The charges were conspiracy to distribute cocaine and money laundering. Despite the evidence at hand, the Haitian government refused to arrest Jacques. Jacques built an $8 million mansion on the hills with Mediterranean columns and fountains. Jacques purchased expensive art. One of the pieces, a Claude Monet piece for $1 million. Jacques also had $4 million in cash, a Cadillac Escalade, and a Hummer H2. Jacques continued to grow his empire and had ships filled with cocaine. Aristide returned and became president of Haiti in 2001. Instead of positive change, Haitian traffickers saw a 25% increase in profits. Between 2002 and 2003, Jacques moved over 2,250 kilos of cocaine to the United States. Jacques was featured on America's Most Wanted in 2001. That same year, he had gotten close to RSD and was asked by RSD to be his youngest daughter's godfather. During investigation, the feds found that Jacques paid Rudy Therasan, a Haitian national police commander, payments of $150,000 every time a plane with cocaine needed to get into Haiti. The $150,000 payments were spread amongst other Haitian officials to keep business moving as usual. In February of 2003, Jacques had a plane loaded with 2,000 pounds of cocaine and decided to work with another Haitian official instead of Rudy. Rudy was allegedly angry at this, and as a result, Jacques' brother and business partner Hector was killed. It hasn't been confirmed that Rudy killed Hector, although a confidential informant stated that Rudy personally killed Hector because of the issue over the loads. Hector's death symbolized the end of Jacques' reign in Haiti. Jacques had issues with his estranged wife, Sybil, and their speculations on whether their domestic issues led to the death of his mother-in-law, Cloudy Adam. Cloudy was murdered in Miami in February of 1997, and Jacques hasn't been charged with the crime. Back in Haiti, Jacques' nephew was upset that a girl he pursued in school had interest in another boy. So he and his cousin, Jacques' son, hunted the boy down and proceeded to beat him. The duo then stuffed him in the back of a trunk and attempted to leave campus. A school security guard spotted the duo and stopped them. As a result of their actions, they were suspended and Jacques was furious. Jacques went to the school and threatened the staff, telling them he would kill the entire staff and burn the school to the ground. Aristide, upon hearing the news, turned his back on Jacques and decided he was a liability. RSD staged a meeting in the presidential palace. When Jacques arrived, Rudy was present and arrested Jacques, who had DEA agents waiting for him. Jacques was extradited to Miami and immediately pled guilty. Jacques cooperated with law enforcement and brought down his former comrades. Jacques gave information that RSD was crucial in turning Haiti into a narco country. Investigators found that Jacques personally delivered $500,000 monthly in a suitcase, which had the combination lock set to 777 because seven was RSD's favorite number. The Jacques crew gifted RSD $200,000 to purchase a helicopter in 2002, which RSD pocketed and used government money to purchase a Biscayne helicopter. Jacques and his crew also donated to RSD's foundation. Due to the allegations of drug affiliation and accusations of corruption, Aristide fled once again in 2004, this time to South Africa, returning to Haiti in 2011. Jacques was sentenced to 27 years in prison and ordered to pay a $30 million restitution. Jacques served his time at a low security federal correctional facility in Louisiana. And after his cooperation with the government, he had his sentence cut in half and was released to immigration authorities in 2015. After several attempts to stay in the United States for fear of his life upon returning to Haiti, 
the U.S. government denied Jacques' request and sent him back home. We would like to give a special thanks to our sponsors over at All Jewel Studios and to every viewer who continues to watch Blood Currency. Hope you enjoy season one.